We're on. Hello, everyone out there in the ether. Welcome, indeed, to the Melbourne Writers' Festival uh, online event known as New Beginnings. Um, it is a huge honour to be here with you. We're streaming across uh, YouTube, uh, via Zoom, those huge corporate uh, companies that uh, facilitate our connection. So I'm very, very happy to be here with three wonderful writers uh, who you will be hearing a lot more from tonight, but I'm sure you'll be hearing a lot more from in the years to come. Uh, we have Heidi Everett, Nicole Smith, and Bo Windham tonight. Um, now, they're all appearing with us here uh, as a uh, collaboration with the Melbourne Writers' Festival and Writers Victoria, as well as the Footscray Community Arts Centre. So we thank them very much for their cooperation with tonight and making this happen. Um, one very quick apology is that uh, we have on screen an automated uh, text system rather than a live uh, Auslan translation. So we apologize for not being able to organize that for tonight. Numerous administrative uh, and financial reasons behind that. But we're really glad that uh, you can all join us here tonight. Uh, tonight is about new beginnings. Um, whenever I think of new beginnings, though, I'm always thinking about the past as well and history and long history. So I do want to acknowledge that where I am, uh, I'm coming to you from Jajawaran country, and I want to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And we, uh, we thank them very much. We also want to uh, acknowledge that the organizations behind this event are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people um, and the Boon and Woiwurrung of the Eastern Kulin Nation as well. So welcome everyone. Um, tonight's gonna, we're gonna look at a whole lot of topics. We're gonna look at, I suppose you could say we're, we're gonna be talking about disability justice but really there's so much more to it. We're talking about human stories in their many different forms, uh, fiction, memoir. Uh, we'll probably touch on poetry because I'm a poet, but that might be in the background more. Uh, we're gonna also be looking at community and interviews and connecting up with other people. So this is very much a story and multiple stories for all of us. Um, I'd like to actually give you more of an introduction than just your names. So uh, what will happen tonight is that each of our writers here will give us a sense of their work for a couple of minutes, and then I'll ask them a question about it. And at the end, uh, there'll be a chance for you to ask your questions. But if you have questions as we go, please put them in the chat, in the YouTube uh, chat there, and that will be relayed to us and we will tackle those questions at the end of our session tonight. Um, so first of all, uh, I'd like to um, introduce Heidi Everett to us. Now, uh, we've crossed paths a few times over the last few years, Heidi. Uh, so I know you pretty well. Uh, others uh, will know you reasonably well and they'll be starting to get to know you. I think a lot of our audience will know you, but you deserve the the bio at least, so I'll read that out for you. <laughs> so Hardy Everett is a neurodiverse artist and producer, creative workshop facilitator, mental health recovery advocate, and social impact innovator in Melbourne, on Wurundjeri country. My Friend Fox is her first book published by Ultimo Press. And My Friend Fox is Heidi's memoir slash fable about what it's like navigating life through Australia's public mental health system as a neurodiverse person. It's been out for a, how long? A couple of months now, would that be right? Oh, it got officially launched on the 1st of September. Oh, okay, a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And it already has a five-star rating on Goodreads, is that right? Yeah, I'm not sure who paid for that, but it certainly does. Um, oh. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Um, so welcome, Heidi. Um, I'd like, I think, um, I think with all these things, with, with writing, we really want to get a texture and get a sense of what that work is. So could you give us a little bit of a sample from the book? Um, feel free to introduce your sample or just dive straight in, whichever you feel more comfortable with. Thanks, Andy, and hi, everyone. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the, the country that I'm on, which is the Wurundjeri country of the Woi Wurrung people. Um, and a quick audio uh, description, I'm wearing a dark purple shirt with a blue star necklace. My hair is medium length, brown, graying, up in two ponytails. And there's a picture of my favourite place behind me, which is the beach. So that's my... Um, hope picture that is so I'm going to put on my google glasses um, <laughs> so I can see through the camera at you all um, put down that stuff that you're picking up there <laughs> no this is my book and uh, please look for it if you're anywhere near a bookshop um, because I can't there's no bookshops near me within five kilometers so if you can see it um, please take a photo at least. <laughs> um, and I'm going to read two pages from the book. And uh, I think you'll get where I am when I, when I start reading. But it goes for about two minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. So here we go. I'm not the best reader, but I'll have a go. I go into the big room on a Monday, Wednesday, and again the following Monday. I sit at one point of a giant triangular table, looking up at three colossal doctors and three titanic nurses. I still don't know how they make everything so big on their side and so tiny on mine. The well-dressed people rock back in their chairs, chew pens, flick pages, punch numbers into calculators and check the vital signs of well-fed clipboards. It makes me think I'm in the wrong room and this is, in fact, a meeting of company accountants going over the monthly budget. The result of the first seminar with the accountants is nothing. In the second, I'm granted two hours of day release. This means being escorted in the psychiatric van to a nearby park. The white eight-seater bus has seatbelts and vertical bars on the windows. We patients climb in the back with stiffened muscles not used for weeks. Everyone immediately asks to get out to have a smoke. We all clamber out again, then five minutes later, get back in. The belts go on and the windows inch open through the bars. The psych nurse is a cheery man with a German accent. He ensures no one needs to go to the toilet, but the mention of it puts the thought in everyone's head. So the sliding door opens again and people get out. Ten minutes later, we're all back in the bus. The door slams shut and the cheery man at the wheel proclaims we're off to the park. And um, if anyone's wondering what, <laughs> thank you. Um, if anyone's wondering what three colossal doctors and three Titanic nurses look like, I'm about to show you. Um, I don't know if that's uh -huh. trans yeah. trans transferable through the internet, but it's a it's a black and white drawing that I made of um, three colossal doctors and three Titanic nurses sitting at a giant triangular table. <laughs> And they are colossal, you know, and not, not just in, the, in that drawing, but in real life, you know. Um, the medical system, especially psychiatric aspect of it, have, they have a lot of power. Um, we talk a lot about uh, the social model, model of disability, um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, social model of mental health. Is that... Is that something that we can sum up really, really briefly? Because I think it's a really, really powerful idea. And I think you're actually, you sort of, it's there in that little extract you had. Yeah, so I am not the expert on the social model of disability. Um, but I kind of 
absorb what I hear and what I see other people say. And the conversation around mental health is still the medical model. So we still talk about people's illness. We still talk about medicating people. We still talk about treating people's unwellness and getting them better. And I find that really um, frustrating because anybody in the mental health advocacy world, we kind of now agree that mental illness is actually a traumatic response. Um, and the memories live, day, like we wake up and the memories are still there from the stuff that caused us to go wonky in the first place. So the social model of, of disability, if, if you apply that to mental health, it, it changes the way I see myself, I see my illness. So I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder at 24, um, amongst other things, you know. But when I think where did that diagnosis actually stem mm -hmm. from, that was not my fault. You know, the, the schizoaffective was almost like an allergic reaction to stress. And I think, you know, when we think about mental illness, it's like asking a person if they can swim without seeing the flood. Mm. And I think, you know, <laughs> it's mm. time we start looking at the flood. <laughs> yeah. And trying to reduce that. Yeah. And that's so, I mean, it's incredibly powerful, that thing about um, saying and acknowledging that it's not your fault um, and that it continues, the reverberations aren't either. Mm. Um, do you feel that the the drawings and the text together is a a really good way of kind of speaking back to that uh, system? Because it it seems to me that both are important in the book. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I, I should actually have preceded what I was saying with a bit of a content warning as well. So um, I don't I don't want to go any deeper into that. But um, you've got to be careful with anyone carrying one of these in a psych ward <laughs> it, it's a pen I'm, I'm holding up a black fine liner and yeah. a little notebook a little blank page notebook because I can take a photograph exactly what I'm seeing and so but it's kind of like if you're in a public psych ward the last thing you're you're thinking of is taking selfies and taking photos of what you're experiencing so my illustrations are like my photographs of, of those situations, not just the psych system, but stuff stuff around that too that led me there. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit like a, a war illustrator that you go into these places and you draw what you see. Um, mm. And the good thing about a pen and paper is that the photographs can also be auditory and sentient. Mm. Yeah, so they have their own kind of power as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, we'll bring Hadi back into the conversation as we go around our, our little circle, which is not a triangle, uh, and there are no uh, giant nurses here either. Um, next up is Bo Winden. So Bo, uh, I want to introduce fully as well. Uh, I love everyone's bio, but um, there are things about Bo's bio that I really love. So, uh, okay, Bo Winden, Bo Winden is a neurodivergent writer of Rotary Descent based in Melbourne. He writes quirky stories about quirky people with a focus on YA fiction. Under the pen name Bo SYW, you can experience his words weaved together in raw chaotic poetry. And I realized the other day Bo and I are in the same issue of Rabbit Poetry Journal. Uh, so I was very honoured to see that. That's great. Um, in 2020, he was awarded an Emerging Writers Festival at Home Residency and a Varuna Fellowship. So things are, there's some momentum happening, Bo. That's great. Welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, momentum is happening. Um, just uh, before I start, I would um, like to acknowledge that I am speaking to you today from Wurundjeri country. And I would like to pay my respects to elders uh, past, present, and emerging. Um, 
And to give a, a brief um, uh, audio description of um, of what's going on here, I am a um, um, a youngish male with a uh, um, long messy brown hair and uh, I haven't shaved since this lockdown started so I'm um, looking like uh, I've just escaped from Jumanji um, and uh, behind me is the Aurora Borealis um, I accidentally enabled it a while ago and uh, can't figure out how to get rid of it um, so you're yeah, going so to read a, a short sample from um, why I work that you're yeah. at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to read um, opening extract from a YA uh, fantasy novel that um, that I'm currently querying around. And um, this this novel is a, um, a product of my desire to see more um, fantastical stories that, uh, featuring characters that are that are neurodivergent and uh, um, having the story be, you know, featuring these kind of characters, but not be uh, entirely about, uh, um, you know, a neurodiverse identity. Um, so that that was kind of like uh, um, the, I guess, origin story of why I started writing this. Um, yeah, I'll read the um, the opening extract. Subaru Heartbreak's first rule of success is if you're about to do anything important, make sure you look like a star while doing it. That's why I spent hours the night before flicking through my collector's edition of Heartbreak's retirement fanzine, effortlessly examining every one of his pictures. What makes a star? I had my assumptions, but he had never came out and said exactly what it was, which made me doubt that I had understood his perception of star correctly at all. It took me weeks to decide on what look of his best exemplified star. But then I also wanted to make sure it didn't look like I was trying too hard. Nobody likes someone that tries too hard. So if I looked too much like a star, then I'd probably come across like a try hard. The outfit I would wear was a complex math problem. I even bought an old fashioned pin board so I could experiment with possible looks. Red string and cut up pictures from expendable magazines littered the board from my ex experimentation. Astra used to joke that I should do that. And now that she hates me, I actually have, and I can't even tell her. After hours of the trialing different outfits, I finally landed on one I liked. My favorite pair of tattered black jeans and the Love Streak Heartbreak t-shirt mum had got me for my 15th birthday. Something casual and comfortable, but stylish, I think. The mirror on the back of my bedroom door and I had a love-hate relationship. Sometimes I'd have extreme bursts of confidence where I thought it was only a matter of time before everyone realized how cool I was. Other times I had to cover it with a bathrobe because the sight of myself made me nauseous. I must have been tired the night before when I finally decided on this outfit because it was close, but not quite there. 20 a.m. Shoot. I had 10 minutes until time to brush my teeth. If I missed that, then I'd have to wait for 8.45 and that would make me late. Flinging open my bottom drawer, I shuffled through it and searched for an outfit fix. When I finally found what I was looking for, I straightened up too fast and had to reach for the wall to balance myself. The TV caught my eye. An underrated craft battle from Echo featuring Subaru Heartbreak versus Vinton Snicket played on it for the 21st morning in a row. It was my go-to motivation viewing. If I needed inspiration, the match that put Heartbreak on the map never failed to pick me up. I stood, transfixed on the greatest mood stabilizer my mum had ever got me, watching Heartbreak ride into his iconic red and black notebook. Within seconds, two crimson wolves leapt from the page and into reality. The camera pulled out as the wolves charged towards Snicket, a regular cinematic feature during Heartbreak's battles. Snicket pressed his feathered quill to a sheet of paper, and a small wave of silver liquid splashed from the page and washed over Heartbreak's hounds. 8.26 a.m. Shoot, shoot, sugar sticks. Sliding on my Echo brand hoodie, I stepped back in front of the mirror. Did that scream star? Braith wild. Daggy, but cool. You got this. Today is your day. After getting to the bathroom to brush my teeth, just in time, I rushed down the stairs, three at a time, making sure not to step on any of the stains. Home was old. Everything in this community was old. Who knows how many people had lived here before us? Who knows what those stains could be? Sure, they might just be red wine, like my mum said, 
but they could also be blood from a previous tenant that cut off his pinky in a fit of panic because he couldn't get it clean. You never know. Mum had left a lovely note of encouragement on the kitchen bench, along with a slice of banana bread, my favorite form of bread and banana, which I ate so fast I almost choked on. Then I grabbed my backpack and ran for the front door, stopping only to pet the ceramic pig my father had left behind. I told Mr. Iggles to wish me luck as I rushed outside, still coughing up banana bread as I ran. Then in a panic, I rushed back to the door to check I had locked it, then checked another two times to be safe. It didn't quite feel right, so I opened the door, stepped inside, then walked out again and made sure it was locked a further two times. Dr. Greenhill wouldn't be happy if he knew I let that happen. He'd lecture me about my disordered alphabet and tell me how I need to focus on self-control or the alphabet could crush me. And um, I'll leave it there. <laughs> That's great. I could keep listening to that for quite a while. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. I love your... Uh... The names that we have here too, uh, Subaru Heartbreak. Yeah, 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 Subaru That's Heartbreak. Right. Um, I, I don't know, I've, like, I, I have a lot of fun with, um, with naming characters in these things. And, you know, I think especially because uh, the target audience is young adults, um, I feel like they'd appreciate it yeah. um, in the same way. Definitely, definitely. It, uh, you mentioned in the intro to that too that you felt like um it was important to have a character whose neurodivergence wasn't the focus of the story but was still there in the story so um do you want to talk about that a little because i think that's a really interesting point we we often see characters included in stories and it's just like it's all about their disability or their or their uh div neurodivergence or their, their deafness or whatever rather than the whole person so yeah. yeah yeah exactly it's um and you know i i i love those kind of books as well um you know it can be so rare to have a book about a disabled character written by a disabled writer so anything like that like um i i eat up but i also like i think of myself when you know i was uh, young and i was put into like special education programs um and uh, and everyone around me and stuff, you know, we we all liked, you know, the same kind of things as everyone else, like the Harry Potters and um, and, and you know those fantastical books. But um, the characters in those are always like you know neurotypical or always able-bodied. They they're always uh, you know they've kind of got um, you know most kind of advantages uh, given to them. And um, as as a kid, I just uh, like I would have loved to have seen a, a character um, with the, um, you know, issues like myself um, that could go out and like, you know, thrive in a fantasy world and, and save the day. And the entire, the entire story isn't just about them having to, you know, deal with a lack of accessibility because of how the world is, but rather it's about them, you know, doing um something awesome and like playing with magic um whilst just interweaving you know a um like a neurodiverse uh, um, character and how the world is kind of um percepted by them in that way um i and i feel like if there were more stories like that for young adults it would um you know a, a lot of uh, a lot of kids and teenagers would probably feel a lot more confident and themselves and um and you know it, it wouldn't feel like you wouldn't have this kind of uh, um constant um crushing feeling that it's like oh well i could never you know i could never do this if if mm -hmm. something extreme happened and i came across magic i would you know i'd be one of the victims or um yeah. I, and i don't think that's the case i i think you know anyone um uh, neurodivergent, disabled, deaf, a anyone could be the hero in a situation like that. And I really want stories that that can show that. Mm. Wonderful. Great. And do you feel like um, there's an element, too, of wanting... No, I, I guess, uh, yeah, people who are neurodivergent actually are often excluded from uh, not just the culture and cultural stories, but from you know, mainstream life too. I mean, you talked about being kind of separated too on some level in your education. Yeah. That must have some kind of impact in terms of, yeah, how you move through the world. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, um, you know, um, Heidi mentioned a bit before about like uh, complex trauma and everything. And there is that, you know, kind of feeling um, I feel um, in, you know, in, in the community where it's like, uh, you know, constantly separated and, and uh, othered from, uh, you know, people that are like able, able-bodied and neurotypical and, you know, everything is kind of like designed for them. Um, and so rather than, uh, um, you know, bringing us into that sphere, we're separated and, and it, it really causes a feeling of like alienation and, and isolation um and in, in that sense like i felt like you know the lockdowns and social isolation i social isolation hasn't been as difficult for me in some ways because it's like i've been isolated you know my whole life from from uh, you know these other communities um and yeah ha- having like stories that kind of address that and uh, you know kind of uh, bring you know those characters into like the able-bodied neurotypical um uh you know world is like important i think yeah yeah absolutely and it seems to me too that you're writing i think probably everyone's work here it's also about bringing the normal typical kind of uh quote unquote normal typical people into disabled world and into different worlds so that uh yeah there's a mutual meeting you know Yeah, yeah yeah um Exactly. I think like, you know, bringing them in and just like letting them, you know, um, you know, witness and experience that, you know, something different, uh, something different to, to what is their, what is like their normal, you know? <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks, Bo. Um, this is a, probably a good segue for us to uh, have a chat with Nicole as well. Um, Nicole's going to uh, talk a little bit about her project, but um, her bio will be a really good introduction to give us a sense of what she's been doing. Uh, Nicole Smith is a writer, wheelchair user, coffee addict, so am I, AFL footy fan and improviser. She works as a digital communications officer and she has a blog where she interviews social entrepreneurs and is a frequent attendee of the Melbourne Writers' Festival. Uh, and is now a panel member at the Melbourne Writers' Festival. So uh, that's Yay. wonderful. I want to say, too, for those of you uh, who want to make a note, um, her blog is called Blank Pages and Empty Spaces. So Google that. You will find it. It's full of fascinating interviews. Um, Nicole, do you want to tell us a little bit about that project? Because I was fascinated seeing the list of people that you've talked to. Yeah. Um, Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri land. um, And I'm going to give you an audio description. So I'm wearing a floral dress. I've got um, glasses on and my fringe is way too long because of lockdown. And I've got hoop earrings, which were a lockdown purchase. And my background isn't as interesting as Bose. It's just blurred my house out. Um, So the blog came from me um, wanting to have somewhere where I could show people what I'd been writing. But people thought that because I was a wheelchair user, that was all I was interested in and that I would write only... um, only about being in a wheelchair. Um, And because that's how I've lived my whole life, I didn't think that was very interesting. Um, And I I found um, other people, I find other people much more interesting than myself. Um, And I became frustrated at um, the Australian media and some of the magazines and the fact that um, I knew who was going out with which Kardashian and everything like that, and I'd never seen an episode of the show. And so I thought there's something wrong with the Australian media that the spotlight doesn't seem to be really on the right people. So I thought, well, if I write about other people, that stops people wanting to read my really personal writing. Um, And I also get to meet some really cool people along the way. So um, Mm. that's where it came from. And um, I can, I really resonate with um, 
Heidi's comments about the power of a blank page and a pen, which is partly um, where the name came from, because it really excites me that um, that you can just have a blank page and you can make it into anything that that, that you want, basically. Um, and so, yeah, I just said about um, deciding to have no shame and mm. googling people and seeing if I could interview them and um, and seeing if they said yes or no. And I haven't had anyone say no yet, so I've been really lucky about that. I've had people say come back to us at a time that's not as busy, um, but I haven't actually had a no response yet because people know that I'm coming from a place of interest and I'm not coming with mm. a particular agenda. I just want to shine the spotlight on their good work. So they've really got nothing to lose from it, I guess. And so how have you, did you go about choosing the people that you wanted to connect with? Like, are there, are there things that they have in common or are, are they across a spectrum of, of people? Um, yeah, so usually I start off by... Um, deciding on a topic that's affecting society that I wish I knew more about. So maybe it's preventing domestic violence or um, assisting with um, homelessness or something like that. And I try to find people that are working in that space. Mm. Um, the difficult thing about my blog is that I try to interview people that aren't well known, but because they're not well known, <laughs> they're sometimes hard to Google. Um, <laughs> So a lot of it is um, word, word of mouth um, and or I might find them through Facebook pages and stuff rather than their own website, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And is it, um, I, I think often with interviews, I, I've, I've only done interviews a couple of times, but I think you often learn about yourself as well, um, as well as the people that you're interviewing. So Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That, um, that's one of the reasons why I don't often go into interviews with set questions. Mm. Um, and I just try and make it a conversation. And sometimes I feel really lazy because I feel like I haven't prepared properly if I'm going in and interviewing someone without set questions. But I guess I just want to have a conversation with them. And then, then it's later on when I'm, um, when I'm listening to the interview that I'll find strands that I'm more interested in. And so... I'll tend to um, I'll tend to focus the interview around that because mm. the way that I write it, it's more like a narrative rather than a Q and A. Mm. Um, and so I'll find out later on um, after the interview where I think the story is and sort of go from there. If that mm. makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. That keys in with uh, that thing about being an improviser as well. That you're interested in the process. And in what happens in that space between two people. Yeah, hmm. definitely. And I think that because I just want to have a conversation, it means that people open up a little bit more because I leave a lot of silence and say, is there any way that you want to take this? So it's not prescribed. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. wonderful. And uh, can you give us a few examples of people that you've been in touch with and people you maybe have yeah, affected you most or have been the most fascinating? Yeah, so one of my one of my favourite people, just because I'm obsessed with his podcast, um, is Hugh Van Kylenberg from the Resilience Project. So they go around to schools um, teaching kids about um, resilience and having, you know, imp improving um, their mental health and um, things like that. So that, that was really good. I've spoken to um, a few people who've lost family members due to domestic violence um, and that's that's been really lovely and then there are the odd um, musician or footballer mm -hmm. that I love and I just want to talk to anyway and then I find a sneaky way or something that they might be doing on the side where I can talk to them um, yeah. so it's a yeah, bit cheeky fun. but anyway works for me <laughs> no that's what it's always about I think you know pursuing what you want and finding a way to go kind of after the fact, yeah, you know, massage it into place. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, I'm going to kind of get uh, a question for all of us. I think at this stage, um, and you know, if there are things that I've missed out, feel free to weave that in too. 
Uh, I will say too that I should uh, uh, visually describe myself as well. Um, I'm not a youngish person. I think I would describe myself as a middle-aged person. Uh, very little hair, um, shaved hair, tiny little bit, very receding hairline. Uh, and a white person, I suppose, male, um, with a grey turtleneck sweater. Um, okay, so our, the question that I've got for all of us, and this relates to our theme, is this whole thing of new beginnings. Um, which implies kind of change, implies that things could be different. Um, there's so many places that we could start. You know, we all are very much aware of uh, the pandemic. We're very much aware of climate change. We're very much aware of the issues around NDIS and disability support. We're aware of so many other problems and things that we're grappling with as a culture. Uh, we've mentioned some of them already. Uh, Nicole's obviously mentioned some in relation to the people she, she's interviewed, uh, domestic violence and um, kind of mentoring and all these kind of topics that are big. Uh, but, of course, there are things going on in people's individual lives at a small level that maybe aren't paid as much attention to. So respond in any way you like. Uh, but I guess the question really is, what what do you think needs to change? Uh, what would you like to see change in the world, uh, or particularly in Australia at the moment? Um, just because we started with you, Heidi, I hope you don't mind going first in this one. Uh, yeah, what do you think? Well, let, let's just say it. Um, <laughs> this is my passion topic. Um, mental health is, is on everyone's um, <clears throat> browser at the moment, um, lockdown, and everyone's um, appropriating it for whatever reasons. I would love to see leaders um, talking about the whole idea of, of mental health um, who aren't the white older psychiatrist model. <laughs> mm. No names, but... Um, you know, I, I want to see a lot more diverse leaders with with um, diverse opinions about mental health rather than just saying, you know, how's your mental health today? Uh, how are you going today in this lockdown? That Here's some mindfulness techniques you can practice because mm. when we do that, we're going to end up with psych wards full of traumatised lock, lockdown people in about two years' time. <laughs> Because I, you know, it's going back to this whole this whole flood scenario, and I just, I, in terms of change, I wish that we we stop treating the pointy end of mental pointy end of mental illness and start looking at where where the water is flowing in from to to really put people in a drowning situation. Mm. Um, and and so far we're just we're just not having those conversations. We're still looking at each of us and saying how are you traveling how are you coping yeah rather than what's going on in your environment that needs some some attention yeah and, and you know there's so many cultural groups where where things have happened or are happening to them um that they're going to end up in in really you know difficult situations because we're, we're just treating the pointy end of things and you know, listening to Nicole and Bo talk about, um, you know, representing but not not defining disability. That that's so important. And Nicole, listening to you speak about the, you know, watching what's on TV with no interest, I, I think part of the flood is is mainstream TV culture. Mm. I just love that metaphor. I have to say, like, um, it does seem like mostly what we're doing is just shouting at people to swim harder or, you know, saying, gee, we should get some more funding so we can throw in some more uh, life jackets rather than go, hang on, maybe we need to pull out the plug a little bit and let some of the water out. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and Beautiful. See, where, see where it's flowing in from to look up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how it's affecting different people and, 
yeah, it's it's way more complicated. And you're you're spot on there. Um, Bo, what, what's what are your thoughts in this area? What what should change? Um, yeah, I bet like one one thing I'd really like to um, see more of, or um, I'd I'd really appreciate it if more organisations had like a um, like a disability officer or like a um, in, inclusive inclusivity inclusivity i can't say that word inclusivity officer um just a um you know because a lot of times um when dealing with um you know say like the publishing industry or like a- any industry really um there's a lot of times where you uh, will have to have a discussion with uh, um you know people that don't quite that that aren't aware of your your circumstances or like you know your barriers and stuff, and um, I feel like you know if organizations um, made more of an effort to uh, you know um, em- employ more more disabled people, more neurodivergent people and stuff, it would it would remove a bit of that barrier because it wouldn't be uh, so intimidating a uh, concept to uh, you know um reach out uh to them um like earlier this year i um went through a process of applying for a grant with creative victoria and one of the things that made me confident in doing that was that they um specifically had a disability officer that that i could talk with and so i I didn't feel quite as nervous you know being you know calling up and talking to them and knowing that they would be sensitive to to my situation and um you know a a bit more understanding to it uh i feel like if uh, you know more of the um not just the publishing industry but if everywhere had a kind of dedicated base there it would uh, it would remove what can be a big barrier for (laughs) you know so many people oh absolutely and there's we all know all writers i think know how stressful it is to engage with a publisher and approach somebody. But then for people with, you know, who are neurodivergent or who are disabled, there's extra emotional labor. And just to remove some of that uh, would be, yeah, would start to reduce some of those barriers. So that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, with like, with, with publishers, there's often this kind of sense of, you know, they want, um, more diverse stories and um, own own voices stuff and everything and um, you know it, it's all well and good having a a quota for that but if you're not you know doing the work to make it um, a more welcome space you know <laughs> for those kind of writers then it's it 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 feel it can feel a bit like lip service um yeah, yeah it, it'd just be nice to um you know if, if you say that you want to work with you know disabled writers or, or disabled people then have someone there that's going to going to make it an accessible experience mm. wonderful that's great Bo. thank you um and nicole uh what are your thoughts what what would be the new beginnings or change that you'd like to see um it's a bit bit of a tug of war for me um, because I grew up not knowing really anybody um, with a disability until I was about 23. Um, and so I, I grew up in a, in a very able-bodied sort of world, which was great in its own way. Um, but I spent a lot of my life um, trying to say, oh, no, I, I don't have a disability. I can fit into the world fine. It, it doesn't make any difference to me. You can still invite me to things that have stairs or find a way around it, you know. So I've spent my whole life trying to fit into society. And the reality is is that um, is that I am quite independent, but I still have to organise um, support workers and everything. I have at least two support workers that come every day. Um, and because I... I'm technically the employer of them. I organise when they come and who comes. Um, and that on its own is sort of a part-time, if not a whole other full-time job. Um, and so I'm trying to live my life and say it's it's not that big a deal and I can work and I can write at the same time. And then I've got to make sure that my 
basic support for me to get out of bed and go to bed at night um, are in place. Um, and so there's a really big tug of war for me between saying that it's not a big deal because if everything goes smoothly, it's not a big deal. And if everything goes smoothly, it's fine. But there is a lot of admin that needs to happen um, that I tried to keep in the background because I don't want to be seen as like a, a burden or, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be seen like I'm not coping. Um, and I think that I think a lot of people with disability come from that viewpoint as well. So it's like the, the NDIS is great in um, for most people, for me, it's been life-changing, um, but it also has its flaws in that they provide me with, with a considerable sum of money um, and they let me control it, but then I'm sort of left to my own devices to make sure that my physio is talking to my OT and my OT is talking to my support workers and, you know, my, my support workers might be asking me about my doctor. So we've got to make sure that like everybody's talking together, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there is an added burden <laughs> that can be exhausting at times just to have the basic supports. Mm. Yeah, and the continual kind of, it's perhaps it's parallel to what Bo was saying, you know, you the doors are opened, but then you have to kind of do the work to get into the door and to explain what you need and, yeah, and absolutely, yeah. and there, there, is, there is the school of thought, oh, well, well, there are people to do that for you, but sometimes when you can't do a, when you can't do a lot and you're um, physically, you, you have a physical disability, you want to control what you can about your life, um, and so it needs to be made easier, I would say. Mm. No, that's good, yeah. Thank you. I will remind people... Um, that we are open to questions. We've got, you know, uh, around 10 minutes to go before we wrap up. So you are welcome to send your questions in. And if they do come in, uh, we will respond to them. They're going to get, you know, put in a little box and sent via carrier pigeon uh, over to me. So you can sort of hear the wings coming now. But um, before we uh, get to that point, if we do get there, um, we've got one coming in, but I'll quickly just ask people, Actually, yeah, why don't we address the question now since it's come in. Um, okay, this is a big question, but I think a good one. We'll get some different answers. How can we use writing to better understand and explain disability advocacy and rights and characters? So I guess we're talking about how does writing, you know, uh, change this, this stuff? Uh, I think we can kind of hear it in some of the writing we've heard tonight. But, um, yeah, maybe uh, anyone want to tackle that one first up? Uh, just just simply, I think there needs to be more, um, more incidental writing about mm -hmm. disability, like Bo was saying before, I think, rather than um, having a character with a disability and that's all that they focus on, having, like, a doctor or a teacher um in the story and they just happen to be in a wheelchair and it's just accepted yeah I, I have think, to say I've seen I see that a little bit happening in uh tv series that the bbc are putting out but doesn't happen here in australia yeah. um and extra and Heidi you have your beautiful hand up oh just quickly I find that um people in the psych system, we're, we're not credible witnesses to our own story and we get medicated when we tell it. So um, when, when we tell our story through the arts, we get celebrated and believed. Mm. And I just, I just see that an incredible um, difference in when I tell exactly the same story in the medical model and when I tell it in the arts, for one, I get punished and the other, I get celebrated. Yeah, no, I've given up on the other one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hope you are sort of continuing to write and write and write. Um, do you have something else 
in the works or is, are you focused now on on this book yeah so i i, lo I love the storytelling art so songwriting theater comedy mm. um you know so i'm i'm doing theater and i'm i'm telling similar stories through theater through qualia theater at the moment and i did it through songwriting for a long time and mm. might plug into that again one day but you know just telling exactly the same story through the different art forms is liberating and powerful Mm. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Bo, did you have questions or uh, thoughts on that question? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, kind of how what I touched on before, just uh, having more more stories and pieces that uh, that are about the people rather than just, uh, um, you know, just the, the disability, um, it, you know, creating that kind of awareness without uh, making uh, you know people th that entire thing mm. yeah yeah I think the other thing I, I think I totally agree with that and I think the other thing that I would mention is it's like uh trying to avoid the cliches too and of course if uh, a person's writing their own story or a, a character that they know of from their own experience then it's going to avoid the the cliches of the uh, you know the victorious um, overcoming tragedy or the uh, terrible uh, pitiful you know horrible yeah. laugh you know like the inspiration porn and yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, you know and I I, I think um, you know uh, able bodied people neurotypical people and stuff that you, they could write about you, you know disabled characters and such. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, incorporate those characters into stories. But if you're going to do something like that, then you know, reach out to to someone in the community to make sure it's authentic and it's not it's not something that's going to appropriate uh, you know our experiences and our struggles. Um, it, and in that in that sense, so I think if you're ever going to write a, a story incorporating a disabled character and you're not a, a disabled person. You should never do it from the point of view of the disabled person because it's not an experience that you can ever really like truly understand in the same way. It should always be taken from a bit of a distance, either if it's, a, you know, um, a, a different uh, um, point of view telling the story or, you know, some kind of device like that. Yeah, there's many a ways of, of approaching it without assuming too much, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question that's come through, which is a... A practical question, I, su I suppose. Um, Heidi, is it true that your book has has come out as an audio book? I can guarantee it because I recorded it myself. <laughs> I... <laughs> um, yeah, so um, and apparently it's on it's on um, audio book platforms. I can't name names, but I've been told it is. Yeah. And um, the other the other drawings um, audio described is that you know what that's a very interesting question and I asked it at the um, studio and it hasn't been answered yet okay so if anyone's out there who can answer that question authentically please do I'm very interested to know mm. yeah good we're coming up with the questions as well that's really good I like that um just out of interest too Nicole what do you have on around the corner do you have um Projects coming up, or are you continuing to do the interviews? Or um, I think because at the moment I'm not um, the blog isn't supporting me financially. I am working full time at the moment, um, and so my blog comes comes and goes in in waves um, about how because um, I'm always really passionate about it, but I sometimes don't have the time to commit to it. So. Um, I, ge I guess moving forward, I just love um, to increase the audience and increase um, the the readership of it because um, I think some of the um, some of the interviews, if I do say so myself, are are of um, quite a good quality. Um, and so I, I'd love to get um, I'd love to get it out to more people. But I'm not I'm not the greatest self promoter, um, which has sometimes worked against me. But um. Hopefully, I do have a few names of people that are like on my wish list to um, interview, and so hopefully, in the coming months or years, I'll get to interview them, and then 
be at another panel talking to you about them. <laughs> Indeed. And, you know, this is, I mean, it's great work that you're doing because it's, it's about making connections between people and across um, areas of activity, you know. So it's, it's broadening the scope of what we're doing. It's, uh, yeah, Thank it's great you. work. Mm. Thanks. Oh, what do you have on Around the Corner? Uh, what's, what's happening for you next up? Um, yeah, well, I've got, I read, uh, I've got that um, manuscript currently out being like queried with agents and publishers. Um, but I've uh, like the moment I finished that, I started work on another um, young adult novel, um, which uh, I'm like slowly making my way through. Um, I, I also write uh, poetry and creative nonfiction. Um, so one of the, the projects that I'd really, um, that I've like been kind of uh, just trying to, I guess, like formulate the structure for at the moment is a hybrid memoir that would kind of mix uh, poetry and like, you know, creative pieces um, to kind of explore my own experiences. Um, so that's, that's something that I'd, that uh, I'm hoping to, um, get out there at some point in the in the future yeah i think we all hope that happens uh that'd be great to see to see come to come to print <laughs> wonderful we're getting we're hitting close to our uh, final eight o'clock session uh time so uh it doesn't look like any other questions have dropped into the chat but heidi has her hand up so Please, oh, Andy, you, you said right at the start that we might get to hear some of your, your work. <laughs> Any chance? I did say that, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time for that. But I will say that uh, I do have a book coming out in next month, in fact, called Human Looking. So keep your uh, senses attuned for that. Um, it will no doubt be a Zoom launch, I think given what we are going through at the moment and are still going through. So, um, yeah, that's exciting. Um, yeah, so I'll be, I'll be joining you in the uh, celebration of a new book. So, again, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to do the, the applause uh, sign uh, at this point. So please uh, do the same where you are. Uh, thank you to Bo Winden, to Nicole Smith, to Heidi Everett, uh, and also, of course, to Writers Victoria, Footscray Community Arts Centre and the Melbourne Writers Festival. Um, I hope you've had a fascinating night. I have. And keep going, keep going, keep reaching out to each other. Take care and see you soon. And buy this book and look these people up online, read their work. See you all soon. Thank you, Thank Andy. You so <laughs> Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.